remember this is this is coming from a backdrop of a time when you had all of the patent trolls um, threatening legal like, oh, yeah. uh, action and then you had Steve Ballmer uh, referring to Linux as a cancer mm -hmm. and how it was going to break 47 or whatever it was of the Microsoft patent so you had a lot of people very concerned about the impact of running the software inside their organization so actually I did sell those contracts almost as like an insurance but what you tended to find is that once a customer realized that you know actually this is, this is fine you know nothing's like going wrong we're not being sued and uh, you know now we're starting to ramp up on our, our training around Linux people know how to use it and manage it and deploy it but the value of the support contracts was starting to re reduce so actually I found it very difficult to renew those contracts maybe after a year or two Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Hacking Open Source Business Podcast. Um, I'm your host, Matt Yakovitz. Uh, once again, joined by Avi Press. And today, I'm joined by Matt. Matt. Matt, Matt Barker. <laughs> Matt, Matt Barker. That's it. The, the two Matts. And, you know, we're in a Matt cave. <laughs> We're in the Matt Cave right oh, now. Gosh. I don't know if you knew that. <laughs> yes, we're live from the Matt Cave at State of <laughs> Open Con. <laughs> what? what the heck? Like, oh, I thought it was... Okay. I've never actually heard that one before. <laughs> yeah. that the Matt great Cave. in Matt Cave at home. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. See? Yeah. The Matts have Matt Caves. Yeah. Are you yeah. jealous, Abby? No, I learned something today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 We get the joke when someone says, would you like a beer, Matt? Yes. Yeah. 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 Or a doormat. A doormat. A doormat. <laughs> yeah. I do get that. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Matt, um, just tell us a little bit about yourself. Introduce yourself real quick. So, I'm Matt Barker. I am co-founder and now president of JetStack, which is effectively a Kubernetes company. Started off the back of the open sourcing of Kubernetes. My background, my entire career history has been in open source software vendors. Okay. Early, a very early employee at Canonical, the guys behind Ubuntu, mm -hmm. uh, to the point where I was interviewed by Mark Shuttleworth and started working with him when he was working out of his front, front room. Mm. And uh, then I was an early employee at MongoDB, uh, and that's before before starting, starting JetStack. So that's eight years ago now. Uh, we were bootstrapped, self-funded, and then were acquired a few years ago. Okay. A very interesting like series yes. of uh, progressions in yeah. your career. I'm really curious. So by the time by the time you started JetStack, can you maybe like compare and contrast kind of the way that you learned about commercializing open source yes. as the way Canonical yeah. saw it versus oh the way God. that Mongo? Well, that was that was a large part <laughs> of what what gave me the confidence to start a company around open source is that I'd seen a few different approaches to the commercial side of open source and they were both wildly different because i think when canonical started and ubuntu was created the it was a it was at a time when if you could get eyeballs and could get users you automatically assumed you would be able to monetize it and that wasn't as easy as i might have thought it would have been and for a while i would say probably our greatest uh, source of revenue was ubuntu t-shirts whoa <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. That doesn't surprise me. I mean, as weird as it sounds, yeah. it doesn't surprise yeah, but, me. But honestly, that was the first the first year or so because we we just Mark had this grand vision, and obviously Red Hat had got some traction, but Red Hat even at the time was a tiny company relatively to to, to the other um, sort of IT companies or BMOS that were out there. And I think it was all around. I think Mark had great visions of maybe an an alternative to to like the apple ecosystem but open and free and, and obviously you, you you must be aware of the name ubuntu meaning humanity to others and humanity to all so i had this mm -hmm. great mission uh led and on day one i was introduced to the concept of uh one of our goals as being uh squashing bug number one which was um beating microsoft so <laughs> it was it was all of like it was very much like a it was a it was a it was a movement it was a passion it was uh quite evangelical quite evangelical mm -hmm. and a lot of the people that joined uh canonical early days were huge open source advocates mm -hmm. like like they were like it, it was it was written into their very dna and, and soul and so you know we had people join the company who'd been like linus torvald's roommate <laughs> you know we had a lot of the the early sort of contributors to the to the you know working with Stallman around the licensing and then uh, early contributors to Linux kernel so we had like uh, that was kind of the world that I was I was kind of uh, introduced to here's me as a as a grad as a grad uh, who just come off three years uh, doing door-to-door -door sales at university thinking how am I going to make money from from uh, from this this and uh, not really working at 
for a long time how to kind of do that mm. uh when when like i said a lot of the only thing that was kind of selling relatively easy was the uh, was the merchandise <laughs> Yeah, that's really crazy. Well, I think yeah. a lot of open source projects end up yeah. through that phase, though, right? Where it's like they can't sell a commercial thing, but they end up getting either donations or, you know, sell the stickers. But very few of them get to the kind of scale. Um, Canonical. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like, that's I mean, very true. That's very true. The first Linux distro I ever used daily was, yes. uh, what was it, Ubuntu? Uh, yeah, which... Uh, <laughs> there, there was a breakthrough moment at Canonical, and that was when I, I was trying to sell services around the operating system itself, and I realized, actually, the value to a company was not in the operating system. It was in the services around it, so how mm -hmm. to make it yep. easier to manage inside an organization. So, so I mean, I'm not even joking. There were, there were people that were calling to try and sell support to who were end users. I mean, I might have even called you and tried to sell <laughs> an Ubuntu support contract in the early days. But when, when, when Ubuntu started to take off, when you started to see it permeate through the um, companies, all of a sudden you'd have, you know, you'd go from having one person using it on a de desktop inside that company who was maybe a sysadmin to then a, an Ubuntu server to then all of a sudden you might have uh, 20 Ubuntu servers running at that time in an early version of AWS. You know, this is this is at the time when AWS started to, to come out and then you'd have it in an on-premise environment uh, in, a, in, in your data center. And all of a sudden they'd be like, how do I do configuration management on this? And it's, it starts to become very difficult because before they were treating it like Treat, treat their servers like like pets, and uh, it's like you have to, to go feed it and water it and update <laughs> it and manage it and do configuration management. When you've got 10, 20, 30 servers, you have to do configuration management. And we came across this, pro we, we created this pro product called Landscape, and uh, and that was configuration management for Ubuntu on a on you know on a larger scale. And that really, I, that was the first time I had a product that I found relatively easy to sell the value of. Hmm. Um, before that, just selling support. I mean, you can make you can make a certain amount of money from it, but yeah. it wasn't going to go very far unless you had something that was going to add real value on top of um, on top of the um, the operating system itself. So once you had something that was a little bit more, you know, concrete in terms of the product that was being sold, mm -hmm. did you find that that affected uh, support and kind of its relationship to that, like were, yes. was was support being kind of like a tack on yeah. to that product? Did that did that? Yeah, how did that affect kind of your yeah. your sales, the revenue, that kind of so thing? So i I had a year or two without having any any add on products to sell, and I I only had the ability to sell uh, support, and it was at a time when legal departments inside those companies were so concerned about open source licenses that they wanted to pay for indemnity mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. on the yeah. on on the on the distro. So I could sell a contract that was backed by Canonical that had indemnification uh, it, built within it. So those were the two pieces of value: was support and indemnification. Remember, this is this is coming from a backdrop of a time when you had all of the patent trolls um, threatening legal like, oh, yeah. uh, action, and then you had Steve Ballmer uh, referring to Linux as a cancer mm -hmm. and how it was going to break forty-seven or whatever it was of the Microsoft patent. So you had a lot of people very concerned about the impact of running the software inside their organization. So actually, I did sell those contracts almost as like an insurance. But what you tended to find is that once a customer realized that, you know, actually this is, this is fine, you know, nothing's like going wrong. We're not getting sued. And, uh, you know, now we're starting to ramp up on our, our training around Linux. People know how to use it and manage it and deploy it, but the value of the support contract was starting to re reduce. So actually, I found it very difficult to renew those contracts maybe after a year or two. Yeah, there's a big uh, renewal problem yeah. with a lot of open source because you're competing against free. Exactly. Yeah. And you have to... I mean, as bad as this sounds, if you're not having problems, the yeah. value continues exactly. to diminish. So the better software you create, the more unlikely it is someone will continue a support contract because they'll look and they'll go, I only used it once in the last two years. Why am I going to yeah. pay X amount of dollars? But I would think that like at the very big, like for the very big, you know, enterprise customers, like you just need those guarantees regardless of if you're making use of them though, right? You would be surprised. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, you would be. I think you would be surprised. Yeah. I mean, I, I, that's what I assumed or hoped, but it didn't always work out that way. When mm. you're paying a couple hundred thousand dollars a year for a support contract, you're not getting sued and maybe you open one support ticket and you know you but you basically the the cost of that support ticket is two hundred thousand dollars. It starts to look a bit strange to someone who might want to spend that budget on hiring a new person to do a lot more with the with the, with 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 um with the budget that they were given. That's what that's I certainly that's what I found. It became a little bit easier when we started to sell to more of the banks because they're highly regulated. And at that time, 
And I think mostly it's the case that if you're running any piece of software, regulation says that you have to have it supported. Mm. So in that case, it's it's slightly easier, but that's that's not always the case. And even in banks, there's still plenty of open source software that's that's um, deployed and run without it being technically being being supported. Yeah, we used to get like I ran um, uh, all of the post sales, like you know, customer success support managed service, you know. So I, I ran that. Yeah. Um, and we used to get you know companies that would come along and they would say like, okay, we opened up two tickets, we need you to cut fifty percent off our bill because we didn't use it as much, and if not, then we're gonna you know yeah. bounce or. Um, because it's open source, there's lots of alternatives, right? You know, the threaten to go to, you know, yeah. CentOS or, exactly. you know, go to Debian directly yeah. without, you know. Yeah. Right. It's so interesting because, like, I've talked to people like at Oracle and they kind of look at the support contract as like, oh, yeah, this is basically pure profit for us. It's just like a 15% gross oh, margin on everything. But that's sell. because they bake in the costs. Like, you have to have a 20% yeah. percent, um, support fee and you can't get any updates without support. I just want so, oh, yeah, so, so yeah, not being able to like, ooh. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So that was yeah. the difference as well. We didn't we didn't charge for updates. And yeah. I think I, I might I mean, again, I'm not entirely sure how right, the Red Hat but, model works, but I'm pretty sure that that it was slightly different. Where you're effectively you're you're paying you're paying the the, the, the totally open source at the time version was Fedora, 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 yeah. And then Red Hat Enterprise Linux was effectively open source, but you would be paying for the for the for the maintenance or the, yeah, the, the, updates, the updates and the, and the, and the fixes, yeah. yeah, and support too. Like and you support. get support, yeah. But yeah, because it's the Red Hat network. Yes. So what it yeah. would do is your mm. when you would register for the repositories in the Red Hat network, it would then like you know take your username password and as soon as your support contract expired, that username password no longer works. So you couldn't get the repo. Oof. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so that's how they did it. Got yes. It. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So that was yeah. So that was a bit, that was a bit that was a bit different. Um, so I was desperate, basically, for something to sell on top. And Landscape, for me, did that. Uh, and it really helped. And But I still had those annoying customers where it was like, oh, this is open source. You should be paying us for the, for the updates, <laughs> for the fixes. Or can I just pay for a one-off ticket for support? And I was like... You know, I'm not going to make my number on uh, you know yeah. one ticket, and no, I, I can't pay you for for that thing. But that's much But it was just, just a very request. different. It was a yeah. very different attitude in those days. It was completely yeah. different. Like these days, open source is like normal, and you know you wouldn't start a business without yeah. using open source software. But genuinely, in those days, you were fighting a huge. Oh yeah, in yeah. every single customer yeah. I spoke to. Yeah, and it involved a lot of legal. Yeah, right. It did. Yeah, but how did you go from that though to Mongo? Well, yeah. So I, I, um, I assumed. Uh, so, so Canonical was great. I had brilliant time at Canonical, and um, I had a great time in engaging customers and selling to enterprises. I, at, Mon at, at, uh, at Canonical, the thing that I didn't really understand or buy into, or I, I wanted more focus on, was how to to sell software to companies and enterprises. Whereas actually, with the with the um, the, the Ubuntu phone. And then Ubuntu ones for storage, and then you know, like you know, the the, the talk of an Ubuntu TV and so on. I, for me, it just wasn't something that I was that interested in. I was more interested in the in the business to business side. So I was looking for. I actually, well, I actually had a, I had a there was a little bit of a gap between uh, Canonical and MongoDB because I, I I was like, well, what I wonder what it's like in the proprietary world. So I, I actually picked the most successful proprietary company in the UK. And I was like, if I go there and just learn what proprietary is uh, as just a test almost, and I can learn about what they do well, maybe I'll learn something more. Because I always in, uh, intended to stay in the open source uh, like world. But I was like, let's just see what a proprietary company does. I ended up choosing Autonomy, which mm. was uh, the company that just got acquired by HP. Um, and so I was there, I went there for about uh, a couple of months, two or three months. I realized how awful it was and then left and, and went straight to Mongo, uh, MongoDB after that. Autonomy, by the way, is the one that just got, um, uh, HP ended up downwriting like $8 billion worth of the $11 billion that they paid. Wow. Them. And the CFO ended up being extradited and is now in prison in the US as far as, as far as I'm aware. Ooh, whoa. Yeah. But uh, so there's a, there's a big story with, with autonomy, but I was like, that was, that was so, so strange. And I, I got to learn a lot about how the proprietary sales model and, and sort of like the way they thought about software was slightly different. And I was like, well, I could go back to Canonical because I loved it there so much, but there were, there were a few uh, open source companies that were hiring in the UK. One of them was MongoDB uh, other than Canonical. And I thought, well, it's database. I'd love to learn about database. And they had a slightly different approach. It felt a lot more commercially driven 
than Canonical, which was a lot more uh, open source uh, focused. And I thought, well, maybe this is the maybe this is the midpoint, the mid- midpoint between like an extremely proprietary uh, focused company and one that's very open source focused. And MongoDB would be where I would learn the, the middle path. And genuinely, that's where I felt like I did. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and I, I think that it is, uh, you know, just a different philosophy because, you know, Mongo was really setting out to commercialize first, right? And the CEO came out and said, you know, this was part of our strategy or go to market strategy, where it sounds like from a canonical, it was more like, you know, we're going to believe well, in absolutely. this and it's more of that, you know, um, evangelist type yeah. thing. Yeah, absolutely. And I assumed that everyone had the same idea about open source that, Mark and Canonical and Ubuntu did in the fact that it was it was um, it was like a precious and to be sort of like really like thought of as something that was um, you know like uh, it was it was about freedom and and sort of engagement and and community and uh, very early do- early on at MongoDB I was in restaurants or bars with the the founders and I was talking to them about open source and it literally shocked me a little bit to hear that they saw it as a just a really good distribution mechanism and that. That was a that was quite shocking for me back in 2012 or 2013 or, or whenever it was, but I, it also like made me think. Well, who am I to say that's wrong? Um, I'm a, I'm at least open minded to sort of seeing whether it, whether it works or not. And bear in mind, MongoDB at this point still still was like it had a, an AGPL license, I believe, and um, it had a quite an active community around it. So like from my standpoint, it was it's been just a more commercial version of a of a of a of, a, of, a, of an open source uh, community uh, and project. And so I I bought in entirely to it, but I, I realized quite early on that it was um yeah, I was I wasn't you know I was in a very different type of company because the types of people that they were hiring were much more commercial in in fo- in, in in focus. So they were hiring really experienced sales salespeople, um, really experienced um, people who'd scaled and, and built very successfully um, valuable companies. Whereas uh, Canonical was much more about hiring the, the most innovative, most forward-thinking open source people who were doing really interesting stuff with it. And I'm not saying that MongoDB didn't have those people; they did, but they were much more focused on just the database and how how is that going to help us reach this point commercially. Yeah. So I guess uh, moving towards Jetstack then, mm-hmm. um, which I think, if I understand correctly, is much more towards the canonical side than it is towards the Mongo yeah. side. Is that is that fair? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think it is. Yeah. I'm curious. So, what were the aspects of the the Mongo side that you think you you like were the most valuable to you as you were kind of both getting started and kind of growing the business? Yeah, I think having seen different approaches to monetizing open source. Uh, and also deciding that I didn't want to take outside investment because I had friends who'd been badly burnt by that. I thought that I would start with the tried and tested model of selling services around Mm. open source to begin with. And that would enable me to hopefully make enough money to hire somebody and then hopefully enough money to be able to then invest profits into experimenting with open source projects ourselves. And then at some point that there would be uh, enough traction in the open source projects that we created that I might then get the chance to create a product strategy or a paid for a proprietary. So like a, either a landscape from canonical world or a MongoDB enterprise feature you know, around automation or backup, yeah. whatever it is around the, the project. So I did have a plan that it was going to start with services hopefully be successful enough for that to create some open source projects and then hopefully at some point then be able to experiment with uh, with products but it wasn't I, you know i didn't mark had you know he he was a he'd sold uh, his previous company thought for 750 million dollars hmm. and um uh, MongoDB uh, with um, you know Maxis and who was who was the ceo at the time they just got investment of you know a couple hundred million so they clearly had you know, the money to be able to do something slightly different. Whereas I knew I was going to have to go through this long journey of kind of testing, but I'd, I'd had the experience of selling all around all these different models to know that if I t- took this one small step with, with, um, with a company this way, I, I might be able to get to the next step, to the next step, to the next step. So I was always hoping to sort of test out the various dis- different models, but uh, I was, it was just going to take a bit longer, but I saw Kubernetes as the perfect be- vehicle for that because a little bit like landscape was the value on top of Ubuntu early days. I saw Kubernetes as being the value on top of the Docker and container ecosystem. So Docker was going to create the market, I thought, but the value was going to be created for companies with the with the automation and the wrapper around it. And I likened Kubernetes in my head to landscape um, at Ubuntu and then uh, with some of the MongoDB enterprise features around the, the open source database. Mm. 
Like that's yeah. Anything, yeah. 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 And um, so with, with um, Jetstack now, so is it, you know, where, where are you on kind of that, that, that curve when you said you started with services and, you know, you yeah. kind of started to evolve. Tell yeah. us a little bit about that. So we grew uh, out of services. The, we we ended up. Um, I was how how am I going to how am I going to find customers? Because at the time, Kubernetes by uh, had only just been open sourced, and if you were using containers, you were actually likely to be using Mesos or Mesosphere, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Container orchestration, uh, and then obviously Docker was the hottest company in town. So KubeCon was much smaller than DockerCon. So I, so the the early innovators in the space were at DockerCon rather than at, at KubeCon by the CNCF. So Swarm, which they created to be an orchestrator for Docker, mm-hmm. was actually probably one of the, probably the, had most of the mind share at least. So in some ways, Jetstack was one of the, was 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 sort of, um, was sort of, you know, we weren't really um, a part of the mainstream <laughs> thinking in those early days by focusing on Kubernetes. So, so we were a bit unique in in that regard, and um, and um, I spent a lot of time kind of researching who might be using Kubernetes. And there was for about a period of about a year, I actually personally tracked every mention of Kubernetes on Twitter and every mention of Kubernetes in every job advert worldwide. And then I would personally then contact that person and try to find out what they were doing with the software. And um, I was trying to trying to find figure out sort of you know what? What? Why? Why? Why are you using Kubernetes? Like, what's the value? What, what do you see the value in it? And I just built this great like little network, but I couldn't find anyone to actually pay for any services because no one was actually deploying at that point. Mm-hmm. The only people that I could find to actually pay us were independent software vendors that felt like it had enough potential to become something that would become very valuable, and we they would they would effectively pay us to create connectors for Kubernetes for, for their mm, existing successful yeah, software. Yeah, kind of like that partnership. Exactly. Thing. Yeah. So that's where, we, that's where we started. And then the other thing that we did was I went to the to the source and then built a relationship with Google because I would go to the Google like office that was that just Google Cloud had just kind of was just kind of starting up to try and compete against Amazon. Part of them open sourcing Kubernetes was obviously to try and compete a little bit against um, the incumbent, which was AWS. And we would go in and actually educate the Google team on what Kubernetes was. And um, that was fantastic for us because they were like, what is Kubernetes? I was like, well, you just open source it, you tell me. But they genuinely didn't, they didn't know because it was so, it was so new. And uh, there was a number of times that Google has said, don't start a company around Kubernetes, do it around our data service instead. You're much more, much, much lower They all risk. say that. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 And I was, getting, I, was getting, I was quite scared. And then other people said, don't start a company around Kubernetes because serverless will just end up taking over everything. So, you know, what's the point of focusing on a container orchestrator or a, container, a cluster manager? So, like, what gave you the conviction uh, to push through all of that? Well, there was, there was a couple of things. The first thing was that um, I'd managed to get in contact with and meet the founders. So, jo- Joe Bader, mm. uh, he was, a, and I, I thought he was brilliant. And I, he just, by speaking to him and understanding what his vision is and where he was going, that gave me a lot of confidence. The fact that it had been in Google and been running a version of it with Borg for 10 years and they were starting 2 billion containers a week at the time. And I was like, well, clearly, you know, this technology can do something pretty. And the fact that it was apparently running stateful services as well as stateless. And I was like, if you can run stateful services inside Kubernetes in Borg in, in Google, then we're going to, we're going to be getting some, this is going to be pretty valuable because I looked at all the valuations of the, the database companies. I was like, well, if you could put one of these databases inside a container inside Kubernetes, then pretty sure Kubernetes is going to be quite valuable. So that gave me the conviction. But the the thing that really triggered it for me was when we created a little open source project, and the founder, one of the other founders, Brendan Burns, sent a tweet saying, "This is the best example of a of an add-on I could ever have imagined for for Kubernetes." And was like, "Well, we're obviously doing something right." And then you had people like Kelsey Hightower who came in and just started talking about Kubernetes and saying how it's a future. And before you know it, you knew it. All of a sudden, it just it just all clicked. And and the, so I, I felt it was the, it was the individuals that I trusted in in the community, as well as you know the, the the I guess the inside knowledge I had from from speaking to Joe and understanding how this technology was used at Google just made me realize that it was a, it was a very good a very good bet. Hmm. Yes, 
I'm so I've got so many follow-up questions. Well, so here's the thing: Matt has a panel to go to, and he needs to leave in like about ten minutes. Okay. Um, okay. So, yeah. so we do have a time limit Oof, here. We do we do? So Let you know, we might want to schedule a follow-up chat with Matt if he's amenable. To, yeah. You know, <laughs> um, we would love to chat more with you. Um, you know, let's let's do another 10, 15 minutes. Yeah. I'm, okay. Let's, let's Great. Good. Great. So I, now you follow. Questions. Yeah. Okay. So I. I'm trying to imagine myself in your position. I, I would be, I, what made you want to stick to specific, like, you know, if, if Mesos was kind of the popular thing at that time, yeah. I'm imagining myself in your situation, I would have been compelled to even try to hedge bets and like try to build for both potentially, or seeing how you can kind of, you yeah. know, be in multiple <clears throat> ecosystems at a time. And I think there are a lot of other open source founders that also kind of have to hitch their wagon to one yeah. ecosystem or another. How are you thinking about kind of going all in on one versus diversifying? If you'd have been my advisor at the time, I might have ended up being... <laughs> maybe I shouldn't have considered Well, you considered would have been it. wrong, though, right? If you were yeah, but, listening to this. But, yeah. but, but genuinely, I did I did actually look at, at Mesos, and uh, there were a couple of customers at MongoDB who'd, um, who'd experimented with it, and they really, really liked it. But then when I started scratching the surface, I... I, I um, I heard from some of the users, and they were saying it's incredibly powerful, but it's taken us a year or two years to get to a point where we've we've actually started to to get our head around how to use it and managing mm. it's so complicated, and um, and just it was just listening to user stories and just hearing that it was it was almost so difficult to set up that I was like I'm not sure I can really be be bothered. And you, you might say Kubernetes is complicated to set up, which it is, yep. but it was actually probably easier though. Uh, than 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 Mesos or Mesosphere. At the, at the I mean, time. orchestration is just a complicated problem yeah. in general. Like, there's not going to be a simple, yeah. Yeah. you know, kind of one size fits all. I'm probably wrong with this as well, but I think I, I saw Mesos. I, I saw Mesos being very closely connected to Mesosphere as a as a company. Mm -hmm. uh, so a little bit more tied mm -hmm. to the to the to the, to the company. Oh, Whereas Google are just given or put Kubernetes into the CNCF as part of the Linux Foundation. So it felt to me like there was more likely to be a bigger ecosystem that grew around Kubernetes than there would around Mesosphere. So as much as I thought Mesosphere might be successful, I, I felt like there was going to be more space for me as a, uh, as a as a founder in an open source project to be in one that was a bit more uh, a, you know, a bit more protected from commercial interests, and that's why um, Kubernetes was also a good, a good, um, good choice. Yeah, that's a really good point because I think that when you look at building an open source company and you're building it around another open source ecosystem, mm -hmm. right? So you're building open source software on top of open source software on top yeah, of open yeah. source software. Um, As we all are. <laughs> you know, picking <laughs> vendors that are or projects that are single vendor controlled is difficult because it does kind of like sway a lot of the development efforts and a lot of the features. And it, and I think it does, you know, potentially, you know, provide some risk, you know, because... But Mesos you, was in the Apache Foundation too at the time, so it's not... So, but even so, with being in the Apache Foundation, that's great and, you know, whatnot. But what you see, you start to see is even with the Apache projects that are out there today, if you look at the core contributors, the majority of core contributors for Cassandra are in, you know, a single company or, you know, uh, you know, a Kafka a or, you know, like, yeah. so, yeah. so you, you end up having a, a lot of politics behind mm -hmm. the scenes, but yes. it still has a very slanted way. And if those developers are focused on enterprise features for their own open core version, yeah. It, it, yeah. yeah. So I mean, but, but you can make the argument that Google is that is that commercial entity behind it, but I think the difference with Google donated, was that they a donated it and b it didn't feel to me like they were trying to use Kubernetes to make money from it directly. Uh, what they cared about was their cloud service. And that so, is like, a fundamental difference. So, so, yeah, the, yeah, yeah, the, com that. the compute, like rather than selling Kubernetes. Right. So again, I mean, I, I and and again, there are people that I was speaking to at the time, and the people I've seen here who were very conscious of Google's influence in Kubernetes, and they were worried. And I was like, yeah, I can kind of see that, but I also feel like this is a fundamental thing they've given to the community because they're trying to compete against Amazon, and they're willing to give it up. And I think, and, and so it was a competitive thing against Amazon, but, but and, they, and they knew what they were doing in that. And so therefore, I felt like it was it was enough dissociated from Google that it was gonna it was gonna create its own ecosystem, which it, which it did because pretty soon afterwards, you know, you had, you had Amazon like creating an Amazon service around it, Microsoft doing the same thing because Brent, and Brendan actually being a founder who ended up being brought in by Microsoft gave me a bit of confidence because I was like Microsoft would not be investing in 
uh, hiring one of the Kubernetes founders and trying to create a Kubernetes service unless yeah. they also had the confidence that it was going to it was going to be, be a standalone um, project that could that could create its own ecosystem around it. So, yeah, but it, it wasn't by any by any means an easy question to answer. Put it that way. Hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah. With last question. Um, so this is a little bit shifting gears a little bit, but um, I guess we talked offline a little bit about the fact that Jetstack had done kind of quite a lot of work uh, to, you know, just generally in measuring metrics around yep. um, open source usage. And we talk about metrics a lot on this podcast. And I'm really curious when Jetstack was first really getting off the ground, um, what, were, what were you all looking at in terms of what you were trying to really measure and optimize? Or were you yeah. at the time? We weren't really measuring much at all. Like mm. The only thing that I could measure it by without knowing much about how you would look at the, uh, at the metrics at all was a um, number of people coming up to me at a conference talking about our project, <laughs> which was quite quite high. And right. the, the passionate, they were very passionate around it. So there was, a, I, I distinctly remember a, a group of um, guys from Finland coming over saying, you've saved so much time here's a $200 bottle of vodka. We have to drink it together now. Thank you so much. And I was like, well, that's a good sign. But that and GitHub stars, and literally it was stars. It wasn't even anything anything else. Um, and um, that was, in some ways, that was, and then obviously a uh, number of people mentioning on Twitter, the number of people joining our Slack channel, um, the number of people from the CNCF that were contacting me about it. Mm. It, it was very messy and, that I didn't have any really good sense of it. Um, so yeah, it was it was stars. It was my own subjective feelings on how many people contacted me about it and and how they how they uh, how they talked about it and responded to it. And then um, yeah, and then and then the, the the really exciting thing was when it started to show up in companies that we were talking to, and that was really exciting. But that my my concept and thinking around it changed immeasurably over time, uh, especially after we acquired, because. Um, we, um, I looked in 2019 as to like whether we should take a product uh, path and uh, take funding around building products and trying to scale um, that way or to keep with services. Um, and being acquired uh, for effectively uh, an opportunity to, to build a product around Cert Manager meant that we had to do a lot more work into looking at the metrics. And, and, and it's only really in the past two or three years. Remember, a form of Cert Manager has been around since 2015 or 16. Uh, in Cube Lego, it's only the past couple of years that I've really understood the importance of metrics and actually had to go about it in a bit, mm. a bit of a better way. And it's um, it's it's very illuminating and it's incredibly powerful and important. So anyone who's listening, you know, I would say it's something you should be thinking about sooner rather than later. If there is there one metric now that you kind of for for you as a business at your stage kind of trumps all? No, and like we okay. we, we 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 struggle to actually uh, to. To, we struggle to to sort of boil it down. So actually, what we've done is we've, we 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 measure a lot of things, and then there are a few in our KPIs that we that we keep we keep track of. Okay. And so I think uh, mm -hmm. it's um it's it's percent it's contributions. It's it's still GitHub stars. It's growth of the Slack channel. Um, and it's uh, Docker pools. Mm, okay. okay. Those are the ones that we kind of like look at and and sort of. Yeah, to kind of tri triangulate into like a like a uh, like a health score basically. Yeah, yeah, okay. that's a great set for people to to look at. Definitely, yeah, absolutely. And um, we are about out of time. I feel like we had talked for many many oh. hours about this. Oh, wait, we oh. have two minutes to do our rapid fire round. Okay. Oh no. <laughs> okay. All right. You're well, going to close me out before rapid fire. You're going yeah, to yeah. try and catch me out here or something. No. Well, no, no. This is no. more like fun. Like okay. Well, yeah. well, actually, the first one is one I normally ask. If you're going to go back in time, you're going to get a DeLorean and go back in time and meet your younger self. What's the one thing you're going to tell them? Uh, one piece of advice. <laughs> I think it would it would be more reassurance. Everything's going to be fine because I, I think I think I have a I have a tendency to overthink. I think most a lot of founders do. Oh, me too. And yeah, then you're kind of like you're looking at every sort of possible avenue, and then you often go down the, the rat hole of like, oh, this is this is going to be much worse than it is. So it's just like trust. Everything's going to be everything's going to work out. So I think even my future self, if I if I came back to now, I'd be saying the same thing. <laughs> fair enough. Yeah, yeah. fair enough. Yeah. Now I normally ask what's your first Linux distro, but I don't have to ask that anymore, right? It is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ask that way. Me too. Um, so, yeah. what is your favorite open source tool right now, outside of your own? Well, I mean, I'm not uh, I'm not actually uh, an engineer by background. I don't I don't use technology a lot. But the one that I really like the look of, uh, and I'm seeing a lot of traction around, is uh, is Nixos. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. All right. Fair enough. 
Fair enough. And um, when you go up on stage, right? what's the theme music that they play or the walk-up music to, to send you up to the top of the stage? Well, I mean, I know it's not very upbeat, but I'm a massive Smiths fan, so Ooh. I'm going to go with the Smiths. Okay. Well, fair enough. We're, we're going to build a playlist from all our guests where we ask that question. Um, so, favorite restaurant here? Favorite restaurant? God, that's a good question. Um, you cannot go wrong with... This, I, I, I've got so many, there's so many restaurants. Yeah, this, is, this, is, this is so difficult to, like, where do I go? Okay, I'm going to say one great all round restaurant you go at any time. Your kids like it. Your family's happy with it. Your parents are happy with it. Nando's. Everyone likes a good Nando's. Have I'm you heard of Nando's? Nando's? No. no. What is it? <laughs> what is it? We're Americans. It, it's, <laughs> it's, um, it's basically a Portuguese style chicken, Ooh, chicken restaurant. That, that oh, is, but okay. But it's okay. done like fast food. And you sit oh, down, all right. So. Yeah, yeah, we've got some of that. It's just yeah. called something different, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I got it. Mm. Uh, all right. right. Nando's. Matt, thank you. Oh, yeah. Thank you for that. We Thanks appreciate so it. Um, yeah. You know, we, we, we love having you on. I really enjoyed it. And um, one of the terms you'll find out, of, you know, you might use if you're in London is let's go for a cheeky Nando's. So maybe we could go for a cheeky Nando's. <laughs> that would be amazing. <laughs> Fair, right. enough. Fair enough. Fair uh, enough. Thank you, everyone, for watching. And don't forget to like and subscribe.